Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It Book by William Walker Atkinson Narrated by Andrew Originally published in 1909 This is a great audiobook production created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 6 Attention As we have seen in the preceding chapters, before one can expect to recall or remember a thing, that thing must have been impressed upon the records of his subconsciousness, distinctly and clearly. And the main factor of the recording of impressions is that quality of the mind that we call attention. All the leading authorities on the subject of memory recognize and teach the value of attention in the cultivation and development of the memory. Tupper says, Memory, the daughter of attention, is the teeming mother of wisdom. Lowell says, Attention is the stuff that memory is made of, and memory is accumulated genius. Paul says, In the power of fixing the attention lies the most precious of the intellectual habits. Locke says, When the ideas that offer themselves are taken notice of, and, as it were, registered in the memory, it is attention. Stewart says, The permanence of the impression which anything leaves on the memory is proportionate to the degree of attention which was originally given to it. Thompson says, The experiences most permanently impressed upon consciousness are those upon which the greatest amount of attention has been fixed. Beattie says, The force wherewith anything strikes the mind is generally in proportion to the degree of attention bestowed upon it. The great art of memory is attention. Inattentive people have always bad memories. K says, it is generally held by philosophers that without some degree of attention no impression of any duration could be made on the mind, or laid up in the memory. Hamilton says, It is a law of the mind that the intensity of the present consciousness determines the vivacity of the future memory. Memory and consciousness are thus in the direct ratio of each other. Vivid consciousness, long memory. Faint consciousness, short memory. No consciousness, no memory. An act of attention, that is an act of concentration, seems thus necessary to every exertion of consciousness. As a certain contraction of the pupil is requisite to every exertion of vision. Attention, then, is to consciousness what the contraction of the pupil is to sight, or to the eye of the mind what the microscope or telescope is to the bodily eye. It constitutes the better half of all intellectual power. We have quoted from the above authorities at considerable length, for the purpose of impressing upon your mind the importance of this subject of attention. The subconscious regions of the mind are the great storehouses of the mental records of impressions from within and without. Its great systems of filing, recording, and indexing these records constitute that which we call memory. But before any of this work is possible, impressions must first have been received. And, as you may see from the quotations just given, these impressions depend upon the power of attention given to the things making the impressions. If there has been given great attention, there will be clear and deep impressions. If there has been given but average attention, there will be but average impressions. If there has been given but faint attention, there will be but faint impressions. If there has been given no attention, there will be no records. One of the most common causes of poor attention is to be found in the lack of interest. We are apt to remember the things in which we have been most interested, because in that outpouring of interest there has been a high degree of attention manifested. A man may have a very poor memory for many things, but when it comes to the things in which his interest is involved he often remembers the most minute details. What is called involuntary attention is that form of attention that follows upon interest, curiosity, or desire, no special effort of the will being required in it. What is called voluntary attention is that form of attention that is bestowed upon objects not necessarily interesting, curious, or attractive. This requires the application of the will and is a mark of a developed character. Every person has more or less involuntary attention, while but few possess developed voluntary attention. The former is instinctive, the latter comes only by practice and training. But there is this important point to be remembered that interest may be developed by voluntary attention bestowed and held upon an object. Things that are originally lacking in sufficient interest to attract the involuntary attention may develop a secondary interest if the voluntary attention be placed upon and held upon them. As Halleck says on this point, When it is said that attention will not take a firm hold on an uninteresting thing, we must not forget that anyone not shallow and fickle can soon discover something interesting in most objects. Here cultivated minds show their especial superiority, 
for the attention which they are able to give generally ends in finding a pearl in the most uninteresting-looking oyster. When an object necessarily loses interest from one point of view, such minds discover in it new attributes. The essence of genius is to present an old thing in new ways. Whether it be some force in nature or some aspect of humanity, it is very difficult to teach another person how to cultivate the attention. This because the whole thing consists so largely in the use of the will, and by faithful practice and persistent application. The first requisite is the determination to use the will. You must argue it out with yourself. Until you become convinced that it is necessary and desirable for you to acquire the art of voluntary attention, you must convince yourself beyond reasonable doubt. This is the first step and one more difficult than it would seem at first sight. The principal difficulty in it lies in the fact that to do the thing you must do some active earnest thinking, and the majority of people are too lazy to indulge in such mental effort. Having mastered this first step, you must induce a strong burning desire to acquire the art of voluntary attention, you must learn to want it hard. In this way, you induce a condition of interest and attractiveness where it was previously lacking. Third and last, you must hold your will firmly and persistently to the task and practice faithfully. Begin by turning your attention upon some uninteresting thing and studying its details until you are able to describe them. This will prove very tiresome at first, but you must stick to it. Do not practice too long at a time at first. Take a rest and try it again later. You will soon find that it comes easier and that a new interest is beginning to manifest itself in the task. Examine this book as practice. Learn how many pages there are in it, how many chapters, how many pages in each chapter. The details of type, printing and binding, all the little things about it, so that you could give another person a full account of the minor details of the book. This may seem uninteresting, and so it will be at first, but a little practice will create a new interest in the petty details, and you will be surprised at the number of little things that you will notice. This plan, practiced on many things, in spare hours, will develop the power of voluntary attention and perception in anyone no matter how deficient he may have been in these things. If you can get someone else to join in the game task with you, and then each endeavor to excel the other in finding details, the task will be much easier, and better work will be accomplished. Begin to take notice of things about you, the places you visit, the things in the rooms, etc. In this way, you will start the habit of noticing things, which is the first requisite for memory development. Halleck gives the following excellent advice on this subject. To look at a thing intelligently is the most difficult of all arts. The first rule for the cultivation of accurate perception is, do not try to perceive the whole of a complex object at once. Take the human face as an example. A man, holding an important position to which he had been elected, offended many people because he could not remember faces and hence failed to recognize individuals the second time he met them. His trouble was in looking at the countenance as a whole. When he changed his method of observation, and noticed carefully the nose, mouth, eyes, chin, and color of hair, he at once began to find recognition easier. He was no longer in difficulty of mistaking A for B, since he remembered that the shape of B's nose was different, or the color of his hair at least three shades lighter. This example shows that another rule can be formulated. Pay careful attention to details. We are perhaps asked to give a minute description of the exterior of a somewhat noted suburban house that we have lately seen. We reply in general terms, giving the size and color of the house. Perhaps we also have an idea of part of the material used in the exterior construction. We are asked to be exact about the shape of the door, porch, roof, chimneys, and windows. Whether the windows are plain or circular, whether they have cornices, or whether the trimmings around them are of the same material as the rest of the house. A friend, who will be unable to see the house, wishes to know definitely about the angles of the roof and the way the windows are arranged with reference to them. Unless we can answer these questions exactly, we merely tantalize our friends by telling them we have seen the house. To see an object merely as an undiscriminated mass of something in a certain place is to do no more than a donkey accomplishes as he trots along. There are three general rules that may be given in this matter of bestowing the voluntary attention in the direction of actually seeing things instead of merely looking at them. The first is, Make yourself take an interest in the thing. The second, see it as if you were taking note of it in order to repeat its details to a friend. This will force you to take notice. The third, 
Give to your subconsciousness a mental command to take note of what you are looking at, say to it. Here, you take note of this and remember it for me. This last consists of a peculiar knack that can be attained by a little practice. It will come to you suddenly after a few trials. Regarding this third rule whereby the subconsciousness is made to work for you, Charles Leland has the following to say, although he uses it to illustrate another point. As I understand it, it is a kind of impulse or projection of will into the coming work. I may here illustrate this with a curious fact in physics. If the reader wished to ring a doorbell so as to produce as much sound as possible, he would probably pull it as far back as he could and then let it go. But if he would, in letting it go, simply give it a tap with his forefinger, he would actually redouble the sound. Or, to shoot an arrow as far as possible, it is not enough to merely draw the bow to its utmost span or tension. If, just as it goes, you will give the bow a quick push, though the effort be trifling, the arrow will fly almost as far again as it would have done without it. Or, if, as is well known in wielding a very sharp saber, we make the draw cut. That is, if to the blow or chop, as with an axe, we also add a certain slight pull, simultaneously, we can cut through a silk handkerchief or a sheep. Forethought is the tap on the bell, the push on the bow, the draw on the saber. It is the deliberate but yet rapid action of the mind when before dismissing thought, we bid the mind to consequently respond. It is more than merely thinking what we are to do. It is the bidding or ordering the self to fulfill a task before willing it. Remember first, last and always, that before you can remember or recollect, you must first perceive. And that perception is possible only through attention and responds in degree to the latter. Therefore, it has truly been said that the great art of memory is attention. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.